Kaidu pursues to the west without the waste of a day. Coming to the town of Krakow, they find the inhabitants deserting it. They storm Krakow and burn it, March 24th, throwing a bridge of boats and planks across the Oder. The column strikes in a German territory, takes Breslau, and finds that resistance is forming to the north at Lignitz. Here, Henry the Pirate, Pious, Polish Duke of Silesia, musters his Germans with the Margrave of Moravia and contingents from the Palatinate of Krakow, about 30,000 in all, strengthened by a force of Teutonic Knights. A little to the south, good King Wen Keslas, the jolly monarch of the Christmas song, is coming up with a powerful array of his Bohemians by forced marches to join Duke Henry. I am completely unfamiliar with that song, but with this strength confronting it, the Mongol flying column increases its pace to reach the army at Lignitz before the Bohemians can come up. On the morning of April 9th, the Polish-German army moves out of Lignitz to try to join forces with the Bohemians. Headed off by Kaidu's advance, it takes position on level ground. The men at arms on foot move forward against the first Mongol formation, which retires before them. Other Mongol regiments appear on their flanks surrounded, surrounding them and begin to cut them down with arrows. Two visions... Uh, two divisions of Poles charge to extricate the unfortunate infantry. They find themselves plunging into clouds of evil-smelling birds that blinds them and conceals the Mongols. Out of this smoke appears what seems to be a great cross with a long beard. In reality, the Mongol standard with its long tails. The fighting is heavy at close range in this smoke screen when a strange rider gallops past the Polish ranks shouting, by Gacy Fly. Yeah, rumbling the tumble here. Uh, Polish horsemen draw back in confusion and are broken by a Mongol charge. Seeing this, Duke Henry charges with his reserve of horsemen, his Silesian and Polish armored knights, and mounted Teutonic crusaders. Mongol reserves appear on their flanks, and they are overwhelmed by numbers. Henry turns to escape with four companions who are killed beside him. He is caught, his head cut off. Few of the Christians survive the field of Lignitz. The right ears of the dead are cut off by the Mongols and packed into sacks to be counted later, while Kaidu moves on to the town of Lignitz. Finding it deserted by its people, he burns it. When Keslas and his Bohemians hear of the catastrophe, while they are still a day's march distant, they turn back hastily, taking up a position in the defile of Glatz, in the hills to the south. The Mongols reconnoiter this position and find it too strong to attack. After resting their horses, they move slowly aside into Bohemia, destroying the towns in their way. When he learns of this, when Keslas hastens back to defend his homeland, but the movement of the Mongols is only a fight. Turning about, they quicken their pace and pass through the defile of Glatz unopposed. Heading into the fertile valleys of Moravia, a foreign army can be gathered to defend it. Moravia is overrun and sacked by Kaidu's riders, who keep on down to Hungary. The good when Keslas of Bohemia writes to Frederick, the German emperor, that he has driven away the Tartars. In the space of a month, the northern column has covered more than 400 miles, fighting two decisive battles, destroying four cities, and breaking up all resistance in Poland and Silesia, from the river Vistula to Leignitz, and now it forges through the valleys of Moravia, watching the Bohemian army and waiting for orders from Subotai. No, Ponce de Aubon, master of the Templars in France, writes to his lord, the saintly Louis of France, that the Tartars have uh, the Tartars have destroyed the country. 
that was of Henry, the Duke of Poland, and killed him with many of his barons, and six of our brothers, with three knights and two sergeants and five hundred of our men at arms. Three of our brothers escaped, and know that all the barons of Germany and the clergy and those in Hungary have taken the cross to go against the Tartars, and if these be vanquished by the will of God, the Tartars will find none to stand against them as far as your land. Now, Zupatai is moving to keep to his timetable. As soon as Kaidu starts off, he releases his second column to skirt the barrier of the Carpathians and head down along the small river march toward Pest. This second column has a long way to go. It is mounted on fast horses, and it, as it goes, it keeps in touch by courier with Kaidu to the north. Then Subatai starts a third flying column, this time to sweep to the south through Galicia. It is, its duty is to clear the southern flank and rejoin the other divisions near Pest on March 17th. It is led by Kadan. And worldly good or not is not exactly proof that God has taken your side. Um, perhaps it won't be good for you, um, uh, but we don't really go into Taoism much so far on this channel. Um, I'll find something. Um, campaign of the Mongols against Middle Europe, winter of 1240 to 1241 of the vulgar era. And I don't know whether they were considering winter to have started with the cross quarter in November or the winter solstice. Um, most cultures, winter was the darkest time of year and spring was when it the temperature started to rise. Fall was when it started to drop. And the brightest time of the year was summer. But we've kind of changed that at some point. I don't know why. Um, concentration at the end of the summer of 1240 of the Common Era, east of the Dnieper, capture of Kiev and Chernigov, early December. Concentration against Middle Earth. Europe, January to February, 1241, between the headwaters of Vistula and Aliez, movement of the four columns began the 1st of March. The main column with Batu and Subatai forced the Carpathians March 12th and reached the assembly point at Pest on the Danube March 17th. The main battles were fought to the west of Sandomir near Lignitz and on the river Sayo, where the Mongols trapped the army of the Hungarians and their allies. In these six weeks, first of March to the middle of April, the Mongol flying columns had crushed four European armies before they could concentrate and had driven off a fifth the Bohemians. The next summer, concentration was in the Hungarian plain. So the route of the main army across the Danube... Um, well, they don't... They have it in dotted lines, but um, and then the raid of Kadan down the Dalmatian coast and withdraw through the Balkans after Ogadai's death was received. Oh no, no, that's where the spotted lines are. And oh, oh, what? No, no, there is X's. Okay. X's dotted lines. Okay. It also has a long way to go. Like the second column, it follows an arc like one of the pinchers of a pair of ice tongs. The points of the pinchers come together at pest March 17th. It breaks up into a smaller detachment. Oh, yeah, now I see that. In smaller detachments to glean what forge it can. 
in the snowbound wood country. It raids the towns for food, but passes by the stronger castles, breaking up the small armed forces it finds in its way. The rivers along its route through Transylvania are not yet swollen by melting snows and the spring rains. The Mongol riders discover fords if they can, or they swim the current. Their horses rope together, the men swimming besides them, holding to their leather kit sacks, inflated with air. They can stop for nothing because they must cover more than forty miles a day through snow. The startled inhabitants of the countryside are aware only that the forests seem to be alive with horsemen, passing like specter riders to an unknown destination. At least once a bit of comedy is played out. In the rich town of Rudan, near a silver mine the, in the mountains, the people see Mongol patrols filtering by. The townspeople are sturdy Germans, and they muster their men-at-arms to go out and give battle to the invaders. The Mongol detachment left to screen the town withdrawals in a feigned retreat. They played their part so well that the Germans believe that they have driven off the enemy. Well content, the German men-at-arms about to face and march back to town to celebrate their victory. Scattering through the tavern, they put aside their weapons and settle down to beer in the good Teutonic fashion. By the time they are well drunk, the Mongols come back through the open gates of the town without striking a blow. They round up the Count are as called, and six hundred men at arms, and take them along into the forest, giving them axes to do pioneer work. Some towns closed their gates, and the defenders lined the walls to watch the Mongols until arrows shot from a distance by the strange horsemen begin to strike them. Astonished, the Christians take shelter, holding up dummies to watch the steel shafts smash through them. At times, the Mongols release a volley of arrows that rises like a cloud and descends on the people within the walls. Are they fire flaming arrows into thatched roofs before riding on? But the southern column, forcing its way through wooded hills, lags behind its schedule. Meanwhile, Subatai has moved along with the rest of the army and the main column, some 40,000 strong. He takes Batu with him and the smaller engines dismounted and roped to slaves, ascending the barrier of the Carpathians toward the pass known as the Russian Gates. He finds the heights held by a frontier guard of Hungarians who have felled trees to block the road. The Mongol advance forces the pass, but is delayed in clearing the road. On March 12th, Subotai is through the heights, taking command of the advance division. He begins the pursuit of the retiring Hungarians, and the pursuit is frightening in its speed. Down from the pass, out into the Hungarian plain, Subatai's Tumans gallop 180 miles in less than three days. On March 15th, two days before the appointed rendezvous, his patrols reach the bank of the Danube. On the 17th, Batu appears with the mass of the Central Division, and the second column comes in, feeling its way down the Danube. It brings word of the progress of Kaidu in the north, and the assurance that Subatai's rank flank is clear. The third column, Du, in from the south, is still missing, but the Mongols have two columns united in front of Pest, ready to give battle to Bela and his Hungarians, the end of the Hungarians. Bela, the king of Hungary, is at that time seated in council with his barons and prelates. You know, not just the rank in the Goetia, or in the Goetia, right? Um, to discuss the danger of a possible Mongol invasion through the Carpathians. You know, if you're if you're going to give a planet, um, well, of course, Jupiter is a planet, but yeah, they are in Pest across the river from Buda, where their army is mobilizing. When they are interrupted by the appearance of the Count of Zolnuk commander of the frontier guard. He reports to the assembly that the frontier of the Carpathians no longer exists, that the Mongols are here at Pest at its heels. Subatai finds the gates of Pest closed, and he is too wise to attempt to cross the broad Danube. So he explores the country, trying to draw the Hungarians out on his side. The river. 
his side of the river. Bella, just as cautious, startled by the appearance of the invaders at his doorstep, issues orders that no one is to venture out against the Mongols. A fighting bishop, lord of Agolan, disobeys the orders. He sallies out with his armored riders, uh, with his armored riders against the detachments of leather-clad frontiersmen who are gathering forage in the village beyond the walls under his eyes. Now, theologically, did they really? Did the Christians really have that much of a high ground there? Um, they were both polytheist pe people. They both kind of sort of thought of God in a sky father sort of way. The mailed Christians charged the group of strange riders who drift away apparently frightened. Agolan and his men press the pursuit with shields dressed and lances down and find themselves sinking into marshy ground over which the lighter Mongols have made their way safely. When the Christians, burdened by their heavy armor, try to extricate themselves, they are caught under the fire of the Mongol arrows. Three of them get back to Pest with the impetuous bishop. The rest are left dead in the swamp. Not until April 4th, when the bulk of his army has crossed from Buddha, does Bela move out of Pest. This, although Bela and his barons wreck little of it, is the day after the missing left wing of the Mongols has appeared at the rendezvous on the Danube, and Subutai has heard that his flying right wing has shattered the poles in the north. He withdraws his Mongols at a walk to lead Bela well away from Pest, and the Hungarian king follows as if led by the hand. The Christians have a great army ar array because Coloman, the king's brother, has brought up the contingents of Slavonia and Croatia, and a force of French Templars has joined them, perhaps a hundred thousand in all, barons, bishops, knights, crusaders, and men-at-arms, with a backbone of sturdy infantry. As they advanced, they grow more confident. Now, we'd... So bishops with, you know, the rest of the prelates and the Goetia would all, it would be Jupiter. Knights would be uh, Saturn. Um, crusaders and men of arms, maybe we'd say that there are um, Mars. That, but the barons, you know, you know, like the dukes would be Venus. So they advancing or more confident. The Mongols are barely to be seen retreating. Their main body has disappeared. Certainly they are weaker in numbers than the Hungarians, and apparently they have no desire to stand and fight. On the sixth day, the Hungarians camp in the plain of Mohi. Ahead of them, when winds a swift river, the Seo. Beyond that, dark forests. To either side rise the vine-clad hills of Tokay and wooded heights. It is the evening of April 9th, and already Duke Henry has fallen at Lagnitz in the north. The Hungarians pitch their tents in the plain of Mohi, build their fires, and water their horses in the river. They are experienced men not to be caught unawares. Their scouts push into the brush beyond the river without seeing any Mongols. Only the tracks of horses are visible. A Russian captive, escaping from Batu's camp, find his way, finds his way to the Hungarians and warns them that the invisible Mongols are in fact camped a few miles farther on. So the Hungarians take precautions against surprise. They are protected by wooded hills on either side, but they encircle their camp with a ring of wagons roped together. Coloman himself goes with a thousand men to the only bridge over the Seyo. Between them and the Mongols, there, this advance keeps watch while the main body within the wagon ring turns in for the night. Before dawn, the Mongols are in motion, returning to the river from their camp five miles away in the brush. One column under Batu approaches the stone bridge over the Seyo. 
the other with Sputai commanding makes for the river lower down to flank the Hungarian camp. At dawn, Batu's riders rush the bridge and are checked by Koloman's thousand Hungarians. The Mongols bring up seven catapults and rank the bridge with heavy missiles. The Hungarians are driven back and the Mongol horsemen come across to deploy into the plain. Meanwhile, undiscovered as yet, Sobotai is fording the Sayo, throwing across a bridge, or, uh, a bridge of beams and tree trunks to aid the crossing in the camp. The Hungarians come out of their tents to find strange horsemen massing on the higher ground. Around them, the Mongols move silently without molesting the Hungarians, but they encircle the camp steadily. The Hungarian cavalry goes out against them and charges in a mass. The Mongols seem to drift away before the Christian charge, closing in on its flanks and sweeping it with volleys of arrows, crippled by the fire that it can not return. The Hungarian charge breaks up, sways back to the camp in confusion. By now, Sabatai's column is coming up and closing the circle about the camp where a multitude of armed men is elbowing about restlessly. Hungry, bewildered, staring at the ranks of dark horsemen, closing the avenues of escape from the camp, the Mongols open fire with volleys of arrows from the higher ground upon the Hungarians. Again, the Hungarian leaders... Koloman and the adventurous Ukulin rally their mounted men to charge out of the wagon ring, but few are willing to follow them at this time. The Templars go out to a man, and again they are cut to pieces and herded back without the Templars who died fighting. The multitude in the camp is unsteady now, with no leadership to direct it. Bella, unskilled at soldiering, is helpless. Koloman, wounded. Then the Mongols move down the slopes, firing flaming arrows and naphtha into the close-packed Hungarian ranks. At the same time, the ring of horsemen opens toward the west, where the, neck, the level plain runs back to the Danube. The Hungarians move toward the opening uncertainly. The first of them gets through the opening without harm. Then they begin to run. They lose all formation as they press through the tents towards safety, cutting the tent ropes to clear away. Bella thinks at first that his army is advancing on the enemy, then seeing the retreat, he joins it. The Mongols cease firing and draw back, allowing the Hungarians to march out unmolested. They move on either side at a foot pace, waiting. Nearly a hundred thousand men are pushing toward safety and their leaders cannot stop them now. It does not matter that safety lies beyond the Danube, six days march away. They push toward the opening in the ring of horsemen. For two days, the slow and terrible flight lasts. The Mongols, waiting until they see men exhausted, ride in and kill them like sheep with their hand weapons. Some of the Hungarians are herded into swamps to be killed more easily. Bella, unrecognized, escapes by the speed of his horse. Bodies are heaped up on the ground for the space of the two days march. 70,000, it is said, die there. And Ogolin and two archbishops and the greater part of the Hungarian nobility, the survivors are fugitives hunted through the hills, drugged by fear. Bella's flight ends in a monastery in the higher Carpathians, where he finds his fellow monarch of yesterday. Boleslas, the chaste, also a refugee. The wounded Koloman, passing through Pest, warns the inhabitants to cross the Danube and escape to the west if they can. Instead, they try to defend their city. It is stormed and burned by the Mongols and its people slain. However great their multitude may have been, the chronicler Thomas of Spilato wrote of the Germans and Hungarians, still greater in that battle was their hardihood. But no people in the world knows as much as the Mongols, especially in warfare in open country, about how to conquer an enemy, either by daring or by knowledge of war. The battle on the Sayo had an aftermath in a Kuril Tai on the other side of the world. Batu reproached Subatai, saying, When we fought together near the river Danube, I lost my friend, 
Bahatu, and thirty men by your fault, for you were late in reaching the battle. You know well, Subatai answered, that where you crossed the river was shallow, and you had a bridge already built. You have forgotten that where I crossed the river was deep, and I had to build a bridge. But Batu admitted that Subatai was right in this, and he yielded credit for the victory over to the Europeans. A, a victory over the Europeans to the old Mongol general. He took for himself, however, the royal pavilion that Bella had abandoned on the field of Mohi. Its splendor appealed to his taste for luxury. Europe in the summer of 1241 of the Common Era. Kaidu, hearing that the campaign in Hungary was won, came down with his column on the way he made a fight at the mass of Bohemians of good king when Keslas and the armed host of the Duke of Saxony. He took and burned the city of Brunn. He called in the flying division, which had been thrown out on his right flank and had swung far north through the Lithuanians and Prussians, almost within sight of the Baltic. Then he rejoined Subutai and Batu on the Hungarian plateau. There the grass was fresh, and the Mongol horses could find good grazing. Subutai gave command to rest and complete the occupation of Hungary. The Mongols would use the Hungarian plain for the base of their next advance, as they had used the Russian Ukraine in the last summer. In four months, Kiev was taken December 6th, and his commands had overrun the mid Middle Europe from the Dnieper to the Vistula near the Baltic. In two months, he had conquered the lands from the Carpathians to the Danube, within three days his columns had annihilated the armed forces that warlike Poland, Hungary, Brandenburg, Saxony, Silesia, and Bohemia had put in the field against him. Their fortresses were obliterated, their cities burned, and the villages sacked. His Mongols had been heavily outnumbered, yet they had suffered so little loss of life that their divisions were intact, and they were ready for the next advance against the Germans and Italians. The Mongols had accomplished this by their discipline and sped speed of movement, and by the brilliant handling of their leaders. In this disastrous invention of the winter of 1240-1241, the people of Europe, not the horsemen from the steppes, were the true Barbarians. Yeah, you know, you use stuff as words like that for hate speech, for, oh, they're a different race, or they're a different tribe, or nation, or language, or religion, and, you know, you know that's not right to use it that way. Four. Dread of the invaders seized on Europe. The shock of the disaster seemed to affect the Westerners like some unlooked for for catastrophe of nature. They could not understand it. Their feudal lords and the church dignitaries had been swept aside like men of straw. Their will to resist had been broken. A great fear of this frontiersman race spread even into far-off lands like Burgundy and Spain, where the name of Tartar was unknown until then. As far as the North Sea, this dread made itself felt. Danish herring fishers failed to put to sea that year, and the price of herrings went up accordingly in England. The Mongols had appeared at so many points within the weeks that the Europeans fancied they must be as numerous as some vast horde. The destruction they caused could only be explained in European